Buyurun hocam. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth International Cinema and Philosophy Symposium. Uh, the name of the session is going to be Philosophy in National and Transnational Films and uh, there will be three speakers in this session including me. But first of all, Ardin Kilmaz is going to start his presentation. After that, I'm going to be the second speaker. And the final speaker is going to be uh, Serdar Hocam. Uh, during the session, every speaker is going to have about 15 minutes for their presentations. And in the end of the presentations, if you want, you can ask your questions. Uh, let's start with the first speaker, Ardin Kilmaz. His presentation is going to be Revealing the Essence of Cinema, a Philosophical Inquiry into the Ontology of Cinema in Paolo Sorrentino's The Hand of God. Yes, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, my title is Revealing the Essence of Cinema, a, Philosoph a Philosophical Inquiry into the Ontology of Cinema in Paolo Sorrentino's The Hand of God. So, uh, in this presentation, I will start with the introduction and, uh, and then try to give some information about Bazin and Cavell's ontological perspectives uh, and, and then go on with uh, what is cinema and who is a filmmaker, a descriptive analysis of The Hand of God by Paolo Sorrentino, uh, the film made by him uh, in 2021. And then I will conclude my speech. So the nature and essence of cinema have long been explored in the complex tapestry of cinematic discourse, attracting the interest of numerous academics, philosophers, and filmmakers. By participating in this continuous conversation, notable figures like Stanley Cavell and Andre Bazin uh, have made a lasting impression on the discourse by putting forth concepts that go beyond simple visual depiction. The way that images and reality interact and how a new reality is constituted have come to be seen uh, as essential components of the cinematic experience. Uh, through an examination of Paolo Sorrentino's The Hand of God, this study explores the profound insights of two notable thinkers, Bazin and Cavell, and aims to expand their theories. The study aims to explore the ontological implications of cinema, examining its fundamental function as a medium for the expression of human experiences and emotions, of course, uh, by putting uh, the filmmaker at its center. The following investigation seeks to clarify uh, the film's complex story, dialogues, and cinematography via the lens of descriptive analysis and question the film's quest in answering the questions of what cinema is and who the director is. Upon examining the philosophical perspectives of Andre Bazin and Stanley Cavell on the concept of cinema, it becomes evident that their views offer valuable insights into the ontology of film. Therefore, before examining Bazin's and Cavell's insights about the ontology of film, it is best to explain what is meant by the ontology of cinema. Ontology means the essence of something. When we say the ontology of cinema, it means that we are interrogati interrogating the circumstances that enables the being of cinema. André Bazin is one of the first and most well-known cinema researchers who questioned cinema within the context of its material essence. Before moving on to moving images, Bazin emphasizes the material potentiality of photographic image. In his essay, The Ontology of Photographic Image, written in 1945, Bazin declares that plastic arts serve as a tool for mummification of the dead. Such arts like sculpture and painting aim to sustain an existence of things. All visual arts preserve objects from the decaying effect of time. Uh, in a way, they freeze the time and enable the object to live on. Photography and uh, practically does the same. However, there is a certain difference between plastic arts and photography. Arts like painting and sculpture embody an object to work on and, and, and of course, there, there is an artist in the uh, frame. 
The artist filters the reality of the object and creates a work of art through their own vision. On the other hand, photography needs an independent medium, an automated machine, actually a camera. A camera detects the reality of an object as the way it is. Even if the photographer has a creative effect on the photograph, by selecting the chunk of reality and limiting it in a frame, the camera determines uh, the image. The utilization of another medium between the object and its representation separates photography from other visual arts. Photograph, uh, photograph and its object, object share a kind of essence because there is a big resemblance between them. This resemblance is so big that no other art can precede this relationship. Surely, Bazin doesn't equate a photograph and its object. However, we may say that this relationship is like a thumb and its fingerprint. A fingerprint is never the same with a thumb, but they surely share an existence, uh, an essence, actually. Taking the essay, the ontology of phot photographic image, as a starting point, Bazin moves on uh, to his examinations about the moving image in his essay, The Myth of Total Cinema. However, these two essays seem contradictory. While the first examines the medium-specific uh, properties of photographic images that connect them to the material world, the latter examines the human desire to create an illusory uh, depiction of the material world. In this essay, Bazin addresses a future ideal that cinema will develop itself with technology and mimic the material world more realistically. Building on this point, Bazin's viewpoint highlights the uh, importance of realism in film, viewing it as the essential quality that sets apart a film as an art form. According to him, the fundamental quality of film is its capacity to depict reality in a way that is consistent with how people see it. Stanley Cavell is a, another important philosopher who explored the ontology of cinema extensively. Although Cavell admits his debt to Bazin, uh, Bazin in his book, The World Viewed Reflections on the of, uh, Ontology of Film, he is also quick to refute what he believes to be Bazin's hurried generalizations about the essence of film. According to Bazin and Cavell, the purpose of the cinematic object is to elicit a contemplation regarding the interaction between viewers and their surroundings. In other words, their main idea is that viewers tend to relate their surroundings through films, which means that films make people think about their subjective reality. Thus, films serve as a frame that builds a reality for viewers, and this choice of reality evokes thought, which is uh, actually a familiar notion for Bazin's conceptual framework. However, Cavell differs from Bazin in his concept of skepticism. Cavell argues that skepticism in modern philosophy extends beyond epistemological boundaries. According to Cavell, there are two distinct realities created around the film. First, there is the reality of the moving image, and next, there is the reality of the audience. These two realities uh, never collide because uh, neither the audience get the change, the reality of the film, nor, uh, nor the film has something to do about the audience. Therefore, there is a certain skeptic uh, situation in, in this dichotomy. He thinks that it becomes an expression of the desire to overcome this skepticism. He thinks that film is a moving image of skepticism. In expressing this idea, he emphasizes that the transformative impact of photography on the history of visual representation lies not in the pursuit of ex uh, exact resemblances between objects and their depictions, but rather in the heightened human fascination with reality. According to Cavell, the advent of photography and moving images marked a pivotal uh, moment, enabling individuals to engage with reality unprecedented, uh, unprecedentedly, free from their uh, constraints of subjective apparatus. In other words, Cavell thinks that photography and moving image are the ways which people utilize to access knowledge about the world without the limits of their subjectivity. 
And when we come to the uh, analysis of Paolo Sorrentino's The Hand of God, uh, we will be talking about what cinema is in the film and who a filmmaker, a film director is, actually. The Hand of God is an Italian autobiographical film directed by Paolo Sorrentino. The film is a coming-of-age drama that draws inspiration from Sorrentino's own experiences growing up in Naples during the 1980s. The story revolves around a young boy named Fabietto Schissa, who is navigating the complexities of adolescence and family dynamics in Naples. Against the backdrop of a vibrant and sometimes chaotic city, uh, the film explores, explores themes of family, friendship, love, and the pursuit of one's dreams. It captures the essence of a particular time and place in Italy while delving into a universal, uh, the universal struggles of growing up. Fabietto is an imaginative character from the start. By imaginative, uh, I mean creative about his emotions and the reality. As the audience, we witness his insights about his youth experiences, and they are almost always dreamlike, full of joy and happiness. He approaches the people around him with emotions and with his creativity and ima imagination. Therefore, we might say that he is far from being a rigid rationalist. For example, he is the only one to believe his aunt's uh, unrealistic experiences. He even develops a friendship with a criminal only to escape the realness of his life. The plot starts to unfold when he meets the crashing reality uh, upon his parents' death. After, his, after this downfall, he seeks a gateway from reality. He finds the remedy in filmmaking because he thinks that cinema is a way to build one's own alternative reality. Then he starts to he starts to question what cinema is and extends his inquiry with the question who a filmmaker is. Fabietto's quest about cinema develops when he meets the famous film director Antonio Capuano. The dialogue between the two gives plenty of hints about the meanings reproduced about the ontology of cinema in the hand of God. Capuano utters some rules about the traits of a person who aims to make films. He thinks that only people who are free from any constraints are able to make films. In order to be free, one must be brave too. In addition, Capua, Capuano uh, emphasizes that imagination and creativity are not enough to make a film. A director should also feel pain inside. When one has pain inside, he or she has, to, uh, has a story to tell. Capuano advises Fabietto to not lose his control uh, ever in his life. When Fabietto hears this, he gets confused. He doesn't know what control means. Uh, what, sh what should he control? Uh, what is the extent of control? He doesn't know about anything about it. Capuano says that he needs to find the meaning of control by his own means. In addition to all that, Capuano advises Fabietto to stay in Naples and not to move to Rome so that he can be true to his environment, he can be true to his origins. He thinks that Fabietto should get inspired from Naples and develop stories from his own surroundings. When we examine this dialogue, we encounter some key words such as freedom, courage, and control. These are the traits that a film director should have. These remind us the concept of authorism in cinema. According to authorism, a film director has the absolute power over his story and overall product of film. Moreover, Capuano addresses an author, uh, authorism, a kind of subjective reality that is fed by the surroundings of the director. Hence, a director should get inspired from the ordinary life circumstances that he or she encounters. This conflicting, uh, conflicting conversation in, uh, enlightens Fabietto towards creating his ideas about what cinema is and who a filmmaker is. Fabietto turns his, his own inner vision and decides that cinema should be about irrationality and distortion. He takes control of his life and moves to Rome. The audience witnesses the change in his character on the train journey he undertakes. 
The dialogue ends at this point, and the meaning creation proceeds, uh, process proceeds with images only. Fabietto is situated behind the glass. We will see it here. Fabietto uh, is situated behind the glass window of the train, and he starts seeing some images that the audience can never be sure if they are a part of reality or Fabietto's imagination. We can see it here. There is a character here, the little monk. Uh, we are introduced, uh, the director introduces him uh, as an imaginary character. No one believes that he is real, uh, he is real but only Fabietto uh, believes that he is real. He is a part of reality. Uh, this shows that uh, Fabietto uh, is not a part of reality. He is a part of uh, out of realness. So uh, he is an imaginative person. These crystal images, like this one and this one, uh, crystal images, uh, by crystal images I mean we are not sure if they are real or not. We are not sure about the real meaning of it. These crystal images are uh, the signs that indicate Fabietto's vision of cinema. Behind the glass window, he seems like he's absorbed by these crystal images. So his existence, in a way, is taken over by cinema. He is now a part of a new reality which is constituted by his own image. Uh, we can see him behind the glass and he uh, starts to listen a song. So uh, he delves into uh, an emotional uh, part of existence. That's why uh, I think that in this image uh, especially, Fabietto learns what cinema is. It is uh, something, uh, it is a platform, it is a forum to leave reality and uh, make your own reality. So if we conclude, uh, Paolo, Sorrenti Paolo Sorrentino's autobiographical film, The Hand of God, is constituted as a personal saga. It is all about the protagonist's experiences as a young man and his developing interest in cinema. Building this interest, Fabietto tries to understand the relationship between cinema and reality. This interrogation also uh, reveals some authentic ideas about the essence of cinema. He finally decides that cinema is a means uh, to build one's own reality. From the point onwards, Sub Fabietto's existence blends with cinema. He becomes a part of the cinematic process and the cinematic existence. As a conclusion, we might say that the hand of God adds the human factor to Bazin's and Cavell's idea of, uh, of the photographic image. The film director constitutes, constitutes a new reality using images and makes these images a part of his own experiences. And that will be all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks for this inspiring presentation. Uh, I'm going to be the second speaker for the uh, session, and my topic is going to be, um, if, if you open my presentation, may I get the remote control, please? Thank you so much. Yeah. I think you can see it. Uh, the topic is going to be surging for traces of feminine agency in Catherine Brelet's cinema in the framework of the new French extremity. Uh, an analysis of a young girl and fat girl. Uh, before I start my presentation, actually, um, I try to uh, some parts more clear. So first of all, I'm going to start my presentation with an introduction section. Um, sorry. After this, after this, we are going to focus on the concept of the new French extremity uh, in terms of uh, feminism and feminine agency. And of course, I will talk about the concept of agency. Uh, moreover, we're going to um, highlight Catherine Bradett and her cinematic approach. Uh, and finally, I'm going to analyze the themes and I'm going to complete my presentation. Let's start with the introduction section. Um, actually, Cinema is an art having a potential to reflect the incidents we have experienced in our daily lives clearly and artlessly, while it often fulfills it with the aid of classical, modern, or postmodern narration. 
uh, it also sometimes uses other ways, such as shaken the conformist traditions, taboos, and conventional rules to indicate the reality. In other words, cinema has recalls to extremity being paradoxical, controversial, and sensational with extreme blood, nudeness, violence, and sex. One of the best examples of this inclination, I mean this tendency, is gonna be the new French extremity for my presentation. And new French extremity is known as a newly emerged cinematic movement common in French cinema, of course. Uh, in this regard, in this context, one of the most prominent members of this approach is the French director Catherine Brella. And the main concern of this study is to highlight how Brella reflects her themes in the context of her cinematic stance and how she destroys the male gaze. So a real young girl and a fat girl are the themes that I'm gonna uh, analyze. But before this, I'm gonna talk about the French, uh, the new French extremity uh, to make some points more clear. So, the new French extremity is a term that emerged in film criticism to describe a wave of French films that gained prominence in the late 1990s and early 2000s. These films are characterized by their extreme and often transgressive content, exploring taboo subjects, su subjects such as violence, sexuality, and social decay, I mean the uh, corruption, I mean, yeah. This movement is seen as a reaction against the more polished and conventional cinema of the time, which aims to shock audiences and challenge established norms. The new French extremity, while not a formally organized movement, represents a notable trend in French cinema, which challenge conventions and push the boundaries of storytelling. It remains a subject of academic study and critical analysis with discussions centering on its cultural impact and the evolution of French cinema in the early 21st century. Uh, to make some points sorry, more clear, let's look at the, some key aspects which help us to define what the new French extremity means. So I try to make some points uh, more clear. The first thing that I'm gonna uh, highlight is gonna be explicit content. The films associated with the new French extremity are known for their explicit and graphic content. This includes explicit scenes of violence, sexuality, and other forms of transgressive behavior. The filmmakers deliberately push the boundaries of what is deemed acceptable in mainstream cinema. Another point that I'm gonna uh, sorry, highlight is exploration of taboo subjects. Uh, directors or, or the, f the, the films and the directors often delve into taboo subjects that challenge social norms. This exploration is not only for shocking value, but uh, it's intended to provoke thought and discussion about these issues. Themes such as violence, sodomosochism, cannibalism, and existential despair are common in this movement. Uh, also aesthetic innovation and psychological intensity uh, are the things that I'm gonna uh, stress uh, in terms of new French extremity. For example, uh, in terms of aesthetic innovation, we can say that directors associated with the new French extremity often employ innovative and unconventional cinematic techniques. This can include nonlinear narratives, long takes, and a raw, unpolished visual style. And the main goal is to create an immersive and whiskerful experience for the viewer. Um, Another point uh, worth mentioning is that it's gonna be psychological intensity. Many films in this movement focus on the psychological aspects of their characters, often portraying their inner turmoil and existential anger. The exploration of human psychology is frequently interwoven with the extreme and whiskerful elements of the narrator. The other things that I have to say about this movement is gonna be uh, provocation and discomfort notable directors and films, and finally, cultural and social critic. So let's focus on provocation and discomfort. The filmmakers uh, associated with this movement aim to provoke discomfort and challenge the audience's sensibilities. 
the explicit content serves a purpose beyond sensationalism, which forces viewers to confront and question their own reactions to the material presented. When uh, looking over notable directors in terms of this movement, we are going to see Gaspar Noy, Catherine Brella, Clark Dennis, Mihail Haneke, and we can give some examples about this moment, like a reversible, like Romance, Trouble Every Day, A Real Young Girl, and The Piano Teacher by Haneke. All these are good, outstanding, or essential examples of the French extremity. And the final thing that I'm going to tell about this movement is cultural and social critic. Beyond individual narratives, these films often offer a broader critique of contemporary French society. They reflect a sense of disillusionment, alienation, social corruption, uh, which helps or which highlights the darker aspects of human existence. Another title uh, that I will uh, try to define is going to be agency and femininity. A, Indeed, I try to define the concept of, concept of agency uh, with regard to feminism. So the explanation is going to be a little bit feministic, I think. Uh, so this term refers to an individual's capacity to act independently, make choices, and exert control over one's own life. So we can say that agency applies to ability to shape one's destiny, pursue goals, and make decisions that align with personal values and desires. When considering agency in relation to freedom and femininity, actually there are some key aspects coming to play, and I'm gonna try to show them uh, under three groups. So the, the, the first one is gonna be freedom and autonomy. Uh, so I can say that agency is closely tied to the idea of freedom and autonomy. In the context of femininity, of course, it involves recognizing and respecting the autonomy of women to make choices about their lives, bodies, and identities. This includes decisions related to education, career, relationships, and personal exploration. Um, the second point I want to highlight is going to be challenging stereotypes and expectations. The concept of agency in femininity often involves challenging traditional gender roles. So women asserting their agency may reject societal expectations which limit their choices or prescribe certain roles. This might include breaking away from stereotypes related to domesticity or conforming to narrow standards of beauty. And the final thing that I want to say is going to be self-expression and identity. Uh, actually, agency allows individuals, including women, to express their unique identities authentically. This can involve choices related to clothing, appearance, and lifestyle. And the freedom to define one's own identity is a crucial aspect of agency in femininity since it challenges norms that attempt to prescribe how women should look or behave. So um, after I form a sort of conceptual framework, I think we can go on with the director, Catherine Brella, and her cinematic approach. So Catherine Brella, a famous French director, is generally known for her distinctive cinematic approach, which delves into intimate portrayals of gender relations and sexuality. Brella's films often challenge uh, social taboos, social norms, social conventions, which offers a raw and unapologetic exploration of human desires and relationships. Uh, her work has been characterized but by its deeply personal portrayal of female sexuality and subjectivity, which uh, often confronts the male gaze and patriarchal representations of women. Uh, in this regard, I can say that Brillard's cinematic style has been associated with a feminist perspective since she embeds her representations of women's sexual subjectivity within a network of other male-directed portrayals of female sexuality, thereby offering a critical commentary on gender dynamics in cinema. Furthermore, her films have been described as extreme representations of violence and graphic sexuality, which positions her as a figurehead for a new trend in contemporary Euro European cinema, which is known as the new French extremity. So, um, 
Actually, um, I want to focus on film analysis. Uh, I have chosen two films uh, in terms of Catherine Rella. The first one is a real young girl, uh, and the second one is a kind of fat girl. Of course, these films are French films, but I uh, have chosen their English names. First of all, I'm going to start with a real young girl. Uh, this film follows the story of Alice, a 14-year-old girl, while she spends a summer vacation with her parents in the French countryside. Uh, the film delves into Alice's sexual awakening and her exploration of her desires and fantasies. Through the narrative, Alice grapples with her burgeoning sexuality, navigating her experiences and emotions as she confronts social expectations and norms. Actually, the film A Real Young Girl by Brella is a provocative exploration of female sexuality of coming of age. Um, here, actually, the, the Brella's Brella cinematic approach is important. In this film, uh, the, the Brella's film uh, features are characterized by its unflinching and raw portrayal of the protagonist's sexual curiosity and exploration. Uh, here, I think the technique Brellet uses is so crucial. So I want to uh, highlight this part, actually. The technique Brellet uses both breaks the male gaze and creates a feminine agency. So for instance, we see the main character, Alice, masturbating, urinating, or touching herself again and again. However, the atmosphere, the camera angles, and cinematic extensions do not form a framework which a man desires to watch, as they are not created to describe Alice as a sexual object. Actually, the descriptions about Alice are highly realistic, and they are really suitable for the nature of a young lady who is curious about her body, and all these scenes actually are very far away from eroticism. Uh, at this point, Brellet uses sexuality and nudeness as a tool to destroy the male gaze, and she deconstructs the established cinematic norms rooted in phallocentric points of view. The second film, Fat Girl, uh, actually uh, fulfills the same thing, um, although their topics are very different from each other. The main idea in terms of feminine agency seem to show similar to me. So let's look at the fat girl. The film Fat Girl, directed by Brella, revolves around a complex and intense relationship between two sisters, Anna and Elena. The story unfolds during a summer vacation where the two sisters navigate the challenges of adolescent sexuality and social expectations. Anna, the younger sister, uh, grapples with her own sexual awakening and uh, body, uh, while Elena experiences her first romantic relationship. The film delves into the interests of sisterhood, uh, desire and exploration of femininity, uh, which culminating in a shocking and thought-provoking conclusion. Uh, the film challenges traditional representations of female, female adolescents and offers a raw and provocative exploration of the complexities of female sexuality and agency. Um, in this film, Brella, as a director, deals with uh, virginity, sexuality, nudeness, and sexual harassment with her own cinematic stance. She explains these taboo subjects by focusing upon women's tendencies, fears, and desires, and the way she reflects them as avant-garde and deviant. This technique contains extraordinary references, and it functions as if it was programmed to break male gaze and to indicate femininity and its essence in a clear way. The fantastic final of the film contributes to argument asserted here, the, the argument that I try to highlight here. And I think this forms the feminine agency in our films. Uh, moreover, she highlights the aesthetic of being fat or being ugly with her own vision, and this is the other factor helping her to break the chains of male-centered cinema. So uh, I want to finish my presentation with a short conclusion. Um, to summarize, at the end of the film reviews, I, ho I have observed that Catherine Brellet has strived to transform the rooted male gaze in cinema with her own vision by using, I mean, utilizing cinema as an agency tool. Uh, moreover, it is possible to allege that she has tried to deconstruct the settled 
feminine images in cinema by reversing the cliche references through sexuality, nudeness, and the description of the aesthetic of being ugly. While perpetuating it, she gets support from the new French extremity, but she commands or recommends it with her cinema or cinematic stance. So the final sentence is going to be like this. Brelet succeeded in something unique with her provocative and sensational style, and her style helps us to break the male gaze. Thanks for your participation. This is the end of my presentation. And our final speaker is going to be Hasan Serdar Gergerlioğlu, and his presentation will be uh, the Parasite of the Future Society, Savers of the Future Society in Turkish Cinema. So, Hocam is gonna start his presentation within a minute. So, ready? Top song, The Memory. And uh, actually, uh, after two uh, extreme philosophical assortments, by panelists and my talk is a little bit simple and uh, I want to share with you uh, my study and uh, first uh, my intention especially for uh, cinema philosophical societies perspective uh, first theoretical and I need to talk about some pre-sequel of my presentation, and uh, and then uh, the theoric and practical, uh, the appliance on my theorics, theoretics uh, is important. And actually, uh, I'm very honored to be part of this society. Uh, and the question is, uh, in first hand, uh, memory is not a uh, thing, the, especially the remembrance, remember something. And when we are looking at the consciousness, uh, the important point in my study, uh, what is consciousness? And of course, this is a big subject and also very philosophical thing. And we couldn't conceive all the thing here. The perspective the simple, uh, simplistically um, let's put it much more practical much more practical means if we can look at consciousness as uh, as we can deal with after trauma after some stress we have to evaluate examine the patient and we have to decide whether the, this patient has some orientation. Especially the main thing, main approach here uh, to approaching to uh, especially consciousness, first philosophically, uh, of course we are using the movies, especially Damien Cox thinking through film, and also the cinema, and both of them, cine philosophy is a very important uh, part of our um, uh, membership. And also, I would like to add neuroscience, and especially neurophilosophical point of view, and, uh, and also uh, dedicated to Churchland. The, the both of them is very famous about neurophilosophy. And is it possible to bring all three of them together, which means the neuroscience philosophy? And because we are dealing with memory, we are dealing with consciousness, and we have to look at what's going on in this perspective. And the important part, especially, The orientation. Orientation is a very important point here. And every time in, in our schools and academy, and we are hearing, even this, the, the primary school, we are hearing 
orientation is important, but as a medical point, especially, what orientation means us, especially three questions. One is where. The other one is when. The other thing, the third thing is who. We are checking three concepts, three things, to understand whether the patient has oriented and or related with this work. And we are trying to understand their question to is, is uh, are the patients has some space uh, cognition where he lives, where she lives. And when we are questioning when do patient have knowledge or information about time, chronos. And the third thing is who? And this is a very philosophical question, but we are simplistically asking uh, the patient whether they know, they know whether um, the, as a human being, himself or herself, who they are. They know their name because the name is important, because name describes orientation. And three part is important to understand consciousness as biological level. And the other question is amygdala, especially. Um, Amygdala is important in the brain. And why this is important? Because fear and anxiety is especially is a very big problem to us. And because of that, we have to understand fear and anxiety uh, as a whole. And because of that, any anxiety situations, any stress situation, even the chronic stress or acute stress will be a big problem to human being or society. And when we are looking at the philosophical background, cogito ergo some perspective, we have to use especially neocortex, the brain, especially the cortex of the brain, which means that thinking brain to understand what's going on. And because of that, the, after the finishing the pre-sequel, we are looking at the subject. The subject is the pursuit of the future society. The question is why I am asking this question, why I am wondering it because the future is a big problem because future couldn't be conceived we are living now only now we don't know tomorrow or more and it gives fear it gives anxiety which means it triggers amygdala it means that it distorts orientation. It means that our consciousness will be in danger. And because of that, we have to understand the future society. And of course, we have to limit some part of it. And which means in Turkish cinema, uh, and the one thematic concept, because as an academic, perspective, we have to limit and limit and limit goes on. And because of that, the savior's concept. Of course, the savior's concept is directly related with it. And when we are looking at, in general, the talk, the, uh, the all of them, especially the philosophical point I gave you, and the other point is the cinematic perspective, sociologic perspective, and futurology. And all of them I think will help us to understand neurosino-philosophical approach. And first, 
the, the, there are many uh, books and also the main topic we are using as a tool cinema to understand sociological perspective, which means the future society. And in this point, of course, there are some important pre-forefathers. Um, the very famous one, the utopianist is Harry de Saint-Simon. Of course, there are some ideals of Durkheim, Comte, and Weber and Marx. And those are, those people have some inclination about the future. They are trying to design the future. Everybody wants to design the future because we are afraid of that. Okay, and we are using cinematic sociology. Why is that? Because art is important. Because art, we can conceive the world much better. And of course, there are um, many things that we the, the helps us to understand with art, specifically in here cinema. Uh, of course, we can use paint and also literature and also you can theater and blah blah. And we are preferring cinema. Of course, we are because we are here and we love cinema. Uh, this is just a little secret. But we have to confess that. And, uh, and Kurtush Kailo says that the cinema is a culture. And also, there are many uh, the art sociology uh, books we have. And a little bit, uh, some headlines of my uh, approach is about first to, to, to, to concluding to, to, uh, to the end point, we have to look at what is the relationship between cinema and society? And actually, this is very important thing. And in here, I prefer, everybody prefers, the, the main and also uh, conservative approaches, and one is author theory. And this author theory, as you know the, from the Andrew series, and everybody knows, and I, have to, I can use my first uh, slides, and we believe that the author film, author director makes the movie, makes the film. And the important thing is, the second thing is slow cinema. Then this is not just a little approach. Why we are dealing with that? Because we have to limit, we have to take few movies, not many of them, because we couldn't conclude, we couldn't get the main idea. We have to, um, make it just small size. And it helps us also, the slow cinema, whether we accept or not, the, the thing is, um, think about the kino, the kinetics, the kinema. The real meaning of cinema is kinema, which means, which comes from the kinetics. And which means that this is not static. There is a movement every time. We have movie. But in order to get the idea beside the catharsis, if we are, if we can watch the movie, watch the cinema slowly, we can understand the space, the space. Because time is slower now. We can focus, we can concentrate on space. Space is important, I can come to that. And because of that, if I apply the author theory and slow cinema and the science fiction movie, I only get two movies. What I think, just only two. Uh, of course, I'm... Uh, excluding the short movies and the series, only the cinematic type. And one is Kaplanoğlu, the other one is Pir Selimoğlu. Those are author uh, 
directors, everybody knows that. And let's just a little bit, we'll come to that, but we have to understand the sociology of the future. And in this perspective, the, even the Alvin Toffler or there are some books related with the, the sociology of the future. And we have to look at two things. One is topos, the other one is chronos. And when we are looking at the topos, and of course, maybe we can come to, sorry. The Gaston Bachelard is a very important person for to understand, uh, understand space better. And, and in this case, we need some scale because we are scientists, we are trying to understand and analyze something. We need to scaling, to scale something. And I, I, I'm looking at the science fiction, fiction movie base. Uh, we have to look at space scale, I, just I'm calling. And we have this topos, kakatopia, utopos, utopia, and ambiguous. And those things are Topos. Topos means space. And everybody knows that utopia, utopos. And this topos is nowhere land, but the negative one. The utopia is a possible place. And kakatopia, possible but a bad place. And also uh, ambiguous style. We can accept both of them in the, at the same time. And of course, the, there are utopic imagination from Campanella till this time, and this topic imagination, welcome to the dark side. Of course, Pink Floyd is better. Yeah. And, but dystopia is a very big problem. But please look at the movies, uh, actually science fiction movies. Many of them dystopic. Why? Because we are always talking about happiness, but we prefer to watch anxiety. We prefer to watch fear. We prefer to watch that. This is not neuroscientifically, this is not a chance. Or as a human being, we are afraid of it. And because of that, we are wondering What's going on? Okay, it is so. It is not so simple to choose blue pill or red pill, and some of them is offering something different. One is Ursula Le Guin, the dispossessed uh, novel, says ambiguous utopia, and the other one is Derby Symes movie. Maybe we can accept that as an uh, author director, and also the science fiction movie is a very famous one, Dream, but it's a fast movie, not a slow one. Sardor Sa Hocam, sorry for the interruption, but uh, you have about one or two minutes. Is it possible to summarize it? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, and zaman zaman. Kronos. Let's look at the time scale of Kronos. I have to divide in future and past. But I have to divide much more than that, once upon a time, and near future, and unseen future. But in here, actually, near future is our perspective. And we can put mythology and also nostalgia in here. Sorry. And also, we need a savior. Why do, the, why do we need a savior? If we have a stress, if we have a threat, we have to, as a society or human being, we have to get rid of it. We need a savior. We, we need a leader. We need a hero. The problem is this. And in both the movie, one is Budai, Grain, the other one is Yol Kenarı, Sideways. Both movies are looking at, in Turkish cinema, as an author-director, has some idea about the future. 
and these uh, directors, uh, the, especially in the near future, they are wondering about what's going on. And those, uh, remember, we have two scale. One is time scale, the other one is space scale. When we are applying those things to the movies, Budai the Grain, I am calling synchronological design. And when I'm looking at, I have no time to prove that, but uh, we can talk later on. Uh, I'm offering transcendental, transcendental utopos for Budai. And at the same time, and like Ursula Le Guin, ambiguous utopos we can see from the movie. If you have seen the movie, you can remember, we can talk about that. And also, I divided uh, the cinetopological mapping with the design of, uh, the, uh, for Budai, Budai is a journey, journey of a hero. And because of that, I have to divide spaces from uh, inside to outside as like a cellular level, the inside the cell and outside the cell like this is just a representation of something. And also, also, thank you for fragment because my two movies from uh, the fragment also, I didn't know that and I'm so happy about that. And, and when, when I'm looking at your canary sideways, I divided also the cinetopological uh, mapping and also I offered Absurd, pure utopos, we can explain later on, maybe questioning about that. And let's look at the final. The Savior Imagination Turkish Cinema. Uh, we are wondering about the apocalypse and the near future about. We are dying. The world may be explode or something. And we are offering some saviors. And Budai is a little bit complicated. Uh, offering of saviors, we can discuss about five type of savior from the movie. We can, uh, th th this is a very strange movie about that. And also, the last thing is about the old Canary. We are seeing that it's a very different movie. This is a very different messiah. The savior here is a very confused say, um, prophet. Uh, and also we have Antichrist in here and uh, we can see that there's a challenge between them. And thank you for, thank you, Sean, for. Thanks for this great presentation. Uh, actually, this is the end of the session, but if you have any questions, we can answer your questions. Uh, we can get your questions if you have any questions. In Turkish, in English, it doesn't make a matter, we can answer them. Do you have any questions for our speakers? To me, Erdin Çocam, Serdar Hocam. Do you want to? Soru sormak isterseniz sorabilirsiniz. Türkçe'de cevaplayabiliriz. İngilizce'de sorabilirsiniz. If you want to ask in English or in Turkish, it doesn't make a matter. You can ask your questions and we can answer them. I think no questions. You have the questions. For? For me? Yeah, please. Hello, thank you. Uh, it's just... Hello? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, no, thank you for the, the talk. Uh, Bria is uh, one of my favorite directors, in fact. Um, it, it, it's a difficult um, subject to raise, but particularly in the film Fat Girl, I'm a Sir, um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about what Bria does with the issue of rape, which is related to the, the shocking ending, but also with, with the sister, Elena's um, relationship, which we see through the lens of her, the eyes of her sister, something akin to a date rape taking place. And that forms a contrast with her own experiences later on. And I wonder if you could say anything more about how you feel that uh, impacts upon your, your comments about agency. Thanks. Thanks for this question, actually. Uh, while I've been choosing the films, actually, I try to find some binary oppositions in the films. 
because actually oppositions feed my comments and feed my ideas in terms of the agency. So the first theme I think is very clear in terms of breaking the male gaze. But the second theme, the fat girl, uh, is a little bit different in terms of Braille's cinematographic uh, perspective. But the mm, nudeness, sexuality, and awakening of a fat girl during the theme and at the end of the theme actually forms a sort of uh, indirect feminine agency, especially the final scene. I, I, uh, you know, it can be a spoiler, you know, but uh, the, the the end of the film, you know, is very shocking and also it's very disturbing. But uh, but all the ends actually may have a potential to contribute to break the male gaze. Also, it's a sort of criticism by the director related to patriarchal and philosophic uh, system, maybe roots related to cinema. So uh, it's my answer, actually. Is it OK? Thanks, thanks, thank you. Is there another question for the session? Otherwise, I'm going to complete the session. Do you have any questions? OK, thanks for your participation. Teşekkür ederiz. İyi akşamlar.